All right, now, um, this sermon is too long, and I apologize ahead of time, but I couldn't cut it in half, so you're going to have to, you're going to have to listen. And number two, it's pollen season, and my larynx, my voice box, is in rebellion, so you'll have to bear with me. And mine isn't the only one. I was pointing to you, Mrs. Bodkin. <laughs> All right, today's Mother's Day. And preachers are expected to have something to say about Mother's Day. I once was... I once didn't mention mothers on Mother's Day. Wrong. <laughs> wrong, wrong, wrong. You don't do that, Reverend. You don't do that, no. no. So you should have something to say, something of worth to say about moms, moms of every shape and size, moms of every color and hue, moms who give each of us our birth, and moms who in turn have given birth. So here's the question. Does this preacher have anything worthwhile to say about this subject? It's a question that haunts this preacher every Sunday, every Sunday. If people are good enough to come here and listen to a sermon week after week, month after month, doesn't the preacher, indeed this particular preacher, have a responsibility to, something, to say something worthwhile? Often, God and I talk about this problem. Uh, the conversation goes something like this. I do the asking, God does the listening. This one-way conversation goes on much more than you might imagine. God and I talk about this matter. Lord, if you are going to call me to do this work, this work of leading in worship, this work of being a pastor, this work of preaching, will you please give me something of value to communicate to the people in front of me? I don't want to simply get up here into this pulpit and spout trivialities. I don't just want to be another pretty face. I don't just want to be another pretty face. Actually, God has taken care of that. I, I, am, not, no, I am not a pretty face. Nor do I want to pretend that I have all the answers to the mysteries of living. But I do want to, to pray for something worthwhile to say, perhaps a word of praise, perhaps a word of promise, perhaps a word of prayer, or maybe a word of hope or encouragement. Can you hear this plea? Can you catch the drama of my prayer? Will you understand me when I tell you that my prayer, Lord, will you give me something of value to say in my preaching, is a 58-year-old prayer? I've been doing this for 58 years, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> it's not a new prayer. My guess is that those who have preceded me have issued a prayer similar to mine. All I really know is that my prayer is now 58 years old. I mention all of this to you because this, and this, this, this might surprise you, I've never been a mother. I've never been a mother. Uh, this is Mother's Day, and I've never been a mother. I lost my mother four months ago. She could have told you something about what it means for her to be a mother, what it meant for her to be a mother. She, she knew more about being a mom and her little finger than I will ever know in my whole body. But she was a shy person, as Garrison Keeler is wont to say. She was a shy person. And she would not have thought herself worthy of being up here and speaking to an audience like this one gathered here today. I said I lost my mother four months ago. That's not quite true, not quite accurate. I did lose my mother in one sense, but I didn't lose her in another sense. She is in my genetic codes. Her love is wrapped around the four boys that she birthed. Her love radiates in my soul space. Her love radiates in my love of music, in my curiosity, and in my wanting to do things right, because that's what she wanted to do. 
So to say that I lost her just doesn't quite do justice to her place in the world. Actually, I live with a mom. I've lived with that mom for uh, 57 years. My, my, my. Yeah, she's my first wife. Um, uh, that always gets a laugh. I love that. that uh, I, I've been doing this for 57 years. I keep talking about my first wife, and every time I do it, someone laughs. Um, and she, too, knows more about being a mom than I would know if I lived to be 234 years old. If I could have convinced her that she's the one who should be up here to speak to you about the gifts of being a mom, I could have tried, but I know the answers. If I had tried to convince her to do this sermon, the answer would have been no, no, and then no. Listen here, Clark Edward Candle Jr., you're the one who answered the call to preach. It's your job. Get at it. Yes, right, right. So let me try. Some years ago, I was uh, seated in our living room. And I heard an interview on television. Oprah Winfrey was interviewing Maria Kennedy Schreiber Schwarzenegger. This was before the split in their marriage. Oprah and Maria greeted one another warmly and there was some small talk and then Oprah inquired of her guest, so Maria, now that you no longer are working at the National Broadcasting Company, what are you doing these days? There was a bit of a pause, and then Maria Kennedy Schreiber Schwarzenegger, mother of four children, does her best to trot out the long list of accomplishments and activities and the books that she has authored. But she hesitates then and she says to Oprah, what I really want to say in answer to your question is that I am the mother of four children. And what I really want to do, she says, is to let that response just float there. No embellishments, no explanations, no codicils, no disclaimers, none of that, just plain and simple, I am a mom. Four children. That's it, and that's enough. I'm a mom. And when she said that, she got my attention, because I was reading the paper at the same time. And then as I listened further, she said some other really important things. She said that in her home, both her mother and her father told her that they thought she was smart. And that she was beautiful. And that she had a first class mind. And they told her that any room that she walked into was lucky because she lit it up. Do you get that? She lit it up. They told her that one day when you find the man that you want to love, that man is going to be the luckiest, most blessed, and most fortunate man in the world to have a woman like you love a man like him. And she went on to say that those wonderfully kind words, those affirmative words, were uttered critically, and, and they, were, they were critically important, rather, to her self-confidence, her sense of well-being, and her faith in her own abilities. Those words that her mom and dad showered on her. They meant everything to her. Okay, now I'd, I'd like you to hold on to that, if you would, please. Just hold on to that. We're going to come back to it. You hold on to that while I tell you about a second piece, because I told you I was doing two things at the same time. Uh, that's very difficult for me, by the way. But I did manage to do that. I was reading this, pace, this piece in the paper on the very same day that that, that that interview took place with Oprah. I was reading the story of this young football player. I want to give you his name so that you understand that this was real life and that we're talking about. His name was Lorenzo Hunter. 
Lorenzo was an outstanding young athlete in the city of Cleveland, a community where I spent 20 years of my life. This young man was talented beyond his years. He was just 16 years old when he was murdered. What happened was this. Apparently, Lorenzo was given a toy gun. It looked real. And with that toy gun, he tried to hold up an older man. But the hoax went badly when the older man pulled out a real gun and shot the 16-year-old not once, not twice, but three times until he was dead. His name was Lorenzo Hunter, a high school football hero. He was the wide receiver on the St. Benedictine High School Championship team. And two weeks later, two more arrests. It seems that there were two other team members, Raymond Williams and John Huddleston. They were also arrested because the police learned that they were there. They were there when the killing took place and they might have been involved in setting up the whole scene that went so badly wrong. And now here they are, accomplices to a federal crime in the first degree. Crime of murder. So here, are, here we are, three youngsters, three young people, each of them supremely talented. Each of them assuredly were going to be offered scholarships to universities. They would have had a free ride, as they say. Raymond Williams was voted Ohio's Mr. Football for that year. <laughs> that means he wasn't just talented, he was supremely talented. He wasn't just good, he was outstanding. He had already accepted a scholarship at West Virginia to play for the Mountaineers. Three special young people, full of promise, full of potential. Now be clear with me. <laughs> They were much more than football players. They were bright, they were gifted, they were football players, yes, but they were going to a university where they had a chance to expand themselves, to extend themselves, a chance to grow their intellectual capacities, to learn something about where they might fit into this world, where they might even find a way to make a contribution to this world beyond their football accomplishments. They would have gone on to a university where they would have at least been exposed to a world beyond the inner city of Cleveland, my wife and I have a pretty clear idea of the inner city of Cleveland. She taught there for 13 years. And now one of them is dead, and two others are going to spend the bulk of their adult lives in jail. Something went wrong, horribly wrong, badly wrong. What was, it, what was it that went wrong? I don't know, and I'll not pretend that I have all the answers, but somehow these two wildly different experiences, the beautiful experience of, of Mara, Maria Schreiber over here and the sad, tragic experience of Lorenzo Hunter over here and his death, a voice came from, from somewhere in my head that said, Talk about this, for God's sake, talk about this. this. This needs to be talked about. Do some reflection, some word of promise about the importance of our homes, about the priceless value of good parents and inescapable the inescapable significance of love, love that is at once tough on the one side and tender on the other side. 
And so the words of Maria Schreiber and the death of Lorenzo Hunter provide me with a chance to say a couple of things about moms, about homemaking, and about our life together. Because if we don't put Mother's Day in its bigger context, then this day, this Mother's Day, doesn't quite make it, at least not to this preacher. Therefore, by your grace, allow me three comments that I hope you'll find fitting. The first thing I want to say is that for the most part, and I'm painting with a big brush here now, for the most part, it's dad's job to find, fix, and finance a house. It's mom's job to make the house a home. And in the main, it is our moms who give birth. I don't remember any, in my 77 years, I don't remember any man giving birth to a baby. If, if I'm wrong about that, I want you to see me after the service and I'll try to correct it. But I don't remember any man giving birth to a baby. It is the moms who carry this miracle of humanity in their wombs. It is moms who labor through birth. It is our moms who nurse and hold and change the diapers, who sing and rock and coo to the little ones. It's moms who half smile and half cry when the baby spits up curdled milk on her brand new dress. Moms are the ones who celebrate birthdays, <laughs> at least in our home. <laughs> Moms are the ones who spend more money than they should on Christmas gifts for the kids. Moms are the ones who insist that their children are now and forever will be above average. Moms are the people who praise their children to the hilt when they finally learn to, and this is a direct quote, when they finally learn, Harold, you did your potty in the toilet. You are wonderful. You understand that? Got that? Is there any ritual in all the world more strange and compelling than that one? Moms are homemakers. Moms are homemakers. And yet one more time, moms are homemakers. And it just seems to me that when you have said that, you have probably identified one of the most important values in all of the world. And that phrase, homemaker, that phrase ought by necessity to be able to stand on its own merit without any need of embellishment or further explanation. I am a homemaker. It's what I do. End of statement. Now, do I need to tell you that homemaking is God's work? And that when moms and dads create homes, they are doing the Lord's work. And if that, <laughs> if that's necessary, that I have to tell you that, then consider it done. It's done. Homemaking is the work of God. The second thing I want to say is it's my strong conviction and my unwavering observation that children need two parents. They need a male and they need a female. They need a man and a woman. They need a man and a woman who love each other. They, they do not need perfect parents. If you if the requirement was for perfect parents to have children, no one would ever have any kids. They do not need perfect parents. <clears throat> children don't need perfect parents. They just need people who are committed to each other, people who are willing to jointly search for truth. Children need parents who understand that life is not just about me and my wants. Children need parents who know that we are in this business of life together. It's not just about the big me. Rather, it's about us, our marriage, our family, our extended family, our community, our world. Can we not agree that this is a spiritual matter? Because when life is defined as, as only me, it's only about what I want, only what I think I need, 
then everyone around me is reduced or shrunk or shriveled or diminished. And I feel a great need to say this. It is part of the legacy of my Christian vocation. It's part and parcel of the central Christian character of our faith. Jesus said it clearly. He said, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Somehow, I think it needs to be shouted in the marketplace of our world. Jesus preached that we belong to a creator God and that life is bigger than me and my wants, and I follow in that heritage. All right, third thing, and, and I am, there is going to be an ending to this sermon. Third thing and last thing. This business of living in a family needs to be a dynamic of limits and freedoms. Children need structure. Children need limits. They need to know that mom and dad are in charge and that when moms and dads say something, they mean it and it is intended, they are intended for it to be acknowledged and to be obeyed and to be served. This is so basic that it was written into the very code of our faith. It's part of the Ten Commandments. Children also need freedom so that they can experience this world in its wonder, in its beauty, in its comedy, and yes, in its tragic elements as well. Notice that I said that it ought to be a dynamic enterprise. As the children go, grow, it will change, as it must. What works for a three-year-old does not necessarily work for a 13-year-old. We need to give our children room to grow on their own. We adults need to be there for them when they thrive, and we need to be there for them when they fall on their faces, as we all have done. And there's one more thing. The last thing that I want to lift before you comes from the line that is in the Christmas narratives of Luke's Gospel. This young woman, whose name was Mary, learns that she is to be the mother of a special child. It is for Mary an indelible, wondrous, incredible, mysterious privilege. She is to be the mother of a young prince. And when it, is, when it finally happened, when the child is finally born in what today we would call a barn, shepherds come and tell Mary that they had been tending their sheep when angels appeared to them and told them to seek a savior who is Christ the Lord. The shepherds were led to that particular barn in a remote place called Bethlehem, and I've been there four times, and believe me when I tell you it is remote. It is immediately after this incident, the adoration of the shepherds, that Luke writes this wonderful line. Luke says that Mary kept all these things And she pondered them in her heart. Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. I just want to conclude by saying that so long as we have moms, so long as we have mothers, who cling to, who hold to a deep reverence <clears throat> over the birth of their babies, so long as we have moms who know and believe and insist that their child, each child, every child is special, that every child has the potential to become a prince or a princess of peace, so long as we have moms and dads who ponder things in their hearts, who tell their children that any room you walk into is blessed because you light it up. So long as that goes on. The world is going to survive. 
And we will continue in our quest to learn the things of God. <laughs> That's what we have to do, you know. We have to learn the things of God. And moms are here to help us do that. That's enough. <laughs> that's probably too much. <laughs> but, but that's enough. 